Yeah, thank you, Mark. So um, it's actually really great following all the uh, presentations this morning because um, hearing about um, employee-centric services is something that we're super passionate about um, in service now. But we're going to try and show you actually how we bring it to life a little bit. Um, also talking about how does that movement to that kind of enterprise service management approach as well. I think we will cover some of that today because we think you know cloud means you can deliver some truly great service management experiences and you can deliver that modernized that optimized consumer grade kind of employee experience that we all know and love when we're back at home so um as mark says my name is Nero Smutlo my role within service now as an evangelist is very much to work with our customers and looking at what they're trying to achieve those outcomes they're trying to achieve um, and I look at how ServiceNow, but not just ServiceNow, actually, that ecosystem of partners, because there's always a huge number of partners in every customer we go and speak to, how that can all be brought together, organised around kind of a process to deliver those kind of optimal experiences. And uh, Liv's going to be helping drive this kind of demonstration for us today. And we wanted to do it like this so that we didn't just talk about it, but we actually showed you um, some of it as well. So when we talk about delivering great service management, we talk about delivering those moments that matter. And we think you can broadly categorize these into four different types of category. So I want to know, these are those kind of like process related questions often, you know, how do I do something? It could be, how do I um, request a new bit of software? How do I get a new mobile phone? It could be, how do I raise a purchase order? You know, taking that approach across the enterprise. And I want to self-serve, I want to get things done myself. I don't necessarily want to phone somebody else up and wait for them to do it for me. I want to be able to do it for myself and get that response really, really rapidly. I need help, you know, something's broken perhaps and um, I just need it fixed. Well, it can be those complex tasks as well. So if you think about some of the tasks that we have in our enterprise, you know, our business, we've got people within there going out and selling um, to new customers. But how do they then onboard that customer? How do they do that due diligence around that customer? How do they do the risk profiling? How do they then get that contract created um, within their contract system? Many, many different steps just in one journey there to onboard a customer. And I need more care. I need to feel supported through everything actually, but also through those kind of more personalized or bigger life events. So by that, we mean things like job promotions or perhaps going off on parental leave or returning back from uh, kind of sick leave. We want to feel cared for um, and not necessarily talk to a bot. We want to be able to talk to a person and have that human interaction when it is really, really valuable as well. But when we just look at IT, actually, it's not made that easy in order to deliver these great services because there's a lot of complexity and we've heard a lot about that this morning. So if we think about it, you know, we have a lot of legacy systems still within IT and that does limit our ability then to deliver those modern grade services because we're not easily able to do this in some of these older systems or perhaps we're not easily able to integrate into those other systems that we need to deliver that whole service. Too much time spent on firefighting and we talked about this in my breakout session earlier today we talked about the fact that you know we want to do this transformation we want to move to that product centric type view of services but if we're spending all of our time firefighting and dealing with all these kind of like incidents that are like attacking us from all directions then we haven't got the time to invest in transforming and building the new and that's a really really tricky challenge i think to overcome and then lastly, that lack of real time visibility. So making it very difficult to make decisions about where you need to focus resources, where you need to focus effort, where you need to focus your improvement. So you, it's very, very difficult as well then to have that conversation back with the business as well as a business partner to kind of say, look, you know, you want all of this on IT, but actually we've got all these other things. What's the priority? This is what will, what will impact your business if we don't do that. So it gives you, you need to have, if you like, that platform for um, having those really good conversations. And this is why we think, you know, if you can go to a kind of a modernized enterprise service uh, management solution and have a common platform, like we talked about for those kind of employee centric services, 
then from a kind of a governance perspective, it makes it a lot easier. You can kind of see that single view across all of those services and you can manage those business orientated services. You can understand, as I said, that impact back to the business. You know, you can look and see what part of your infrastructure is driving which critical component of the business. And clearly, if there's a problem there, you can then, you know, take action in, a, in an appropriate way. And ideally, you want to move from that kind of reactive to proactive to predictive approach. And that's going to lead to a much better employee experience. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just kind of have a little look at this from a sort of an IT fulfillment uh, perspective. So what we're going to show here is we have a we have a nice dashboard and this has kind of moved on quite away really from those kind of tables and list views that perhaps we had before. And what we're trying to also do is make sure that not only do agents have a view of what they need to work on right now, but also they can see kind of trends over time. So they can see, you know, all oh, my number of interactions going up, are my incident numbers going up over time? Because clearly there's a problem here. You're building more and more backlog. But the important thing is about this is when you're looking at how you present it to your agents, making sure that you're configuring those dashboards that's appropriate for their role and what they care about, but also letting them personalise those dashboards. So everybody works in different ways. People consume information in different ways and like information presented in different ways. So I think it's quite important to give people a bit of autonomy about how they want to work, but still on a kind of a standard, standard platform. There. So if you noticed, we had a, um, a red uh, uh, colour there for incidents, which means to that basically we've kind of breached a threshold in terms of the number of incidents that we've got in our queue. So we need to get kind of working on these. Now, when you start to look at incidents, it's no surprise, um, every service management tool will have detail around the kind of the priority, the category, the description of it. Then if you think about it in the middle, what we're wanting to show here is all the history of all those interactions. So that interaction could have started off on a live chat. It could have started off on a virtual chat. It could have actually been picked up by another service desk agent, but making sure that that history is presented there. So if that end user phones in, they're not having to repeat what they've already put on a chat bot, or they're not having to repeat what they've already told one of your colleagues. But that's you know, not particularly uh, cutting edge. I think what's more interesting really is where we look at the agent assist piece on the, on the right hand side. And this is a bit like what um, Duncan talked about, bringing in kind of automation, but also artificial intelligence, machine learning into this. Because if you can start to help your agents in terms of delivering um, the service through proactively suggesting to them what they need to do, then they're going to deliver a quality and a consistent service every single time. So in this scenario, we've got a broken iPhone. There's not a lot you can do about broken iPhone. Um, but what, what's happening is that the system is looking at the context of this call, looking at all the previous history and how we've resolved these types of calls, and it's pushing to that agent what they have to do to resolve it. And actually, in this scenario, it's just ordering a new one. And again, thinking about the agent as an employee as well, giving them that consumer grade experience is just as important as, as those end users as well. So making sure that they have that kind of Amazon like shopping experience that we all know and definitely uh, love and rely on probably um, after this last year. Um, another challenge that we see in most organisations or many organisations that we work with anyway, is that we operate in global environments. We certainly operate in an environment that's perhaps not just in one country. And that again poses some challenges, I think, when we're looking at how we deliver services. So we either have service desks in each country, or we have a global service desk. And on that global service desk, you have to have people that can speak many different languages. Or worse, you ask that end user to adopt perhaps English as a sort of like a business language, which isn't necessarily a great experience for them. But what you can do is you can create a better experience. And like I said earlier, you know, we don't operate in a bubble and we've got partnerships with many, many vendors. And Microsoft is one of our big strategic partnerships. And they've got a great capability on Azure around dynamic translation. And we can leverage this and we can leverage this and we can use that translation capability to take in an interaction. In this scenario, it's coming from a Japanese end user. 
Um, I don't speak Japanese, neither does Liv, but it doesn't matter because we're just going to simply click on that button and then we're going to dynamically translate it back into English. And of course, we've clicked the button. Um, in reality, you would script this in so that, you know, it would translate automatically to the agent's kind of native language as it came in. But we wanted to kind of show you that. Now, then when the agent was updating that uh, incident, what they could do is they could then translate it back. So that end user gets a great experience because actually they haven't had to speak in, you know, their non-native language because of the way that the dynamic translation works. It does kind of, it's more contextual rather than a, an intelligent, rather than a kind of word for word type translation, which means it's likely that it's much more meaningful and you can understand and then you can get a first time resolution or at least move that resolution on quite quickly. So you can see there, from an end user's experience, it's um, it's a great experience. From a serviceless perspective, um, we've got a really good benefit here because we're able to offer those global type um, services, but we're not having to necessarily recruit so many people from many, many different countries or, lang or speak many different languages in order to service their needs. So we thought now we'd flip it around and look a bit more at that kind of consumer experience. So consumerization of the enterprise, it's not anything particularly new, to be honest. Um, but again, it's got a real kind of revived focus, I would say, um, most recently. And I think there are now five generations of people in the workplace. And by 2025, I think it was estimated that um, millennials would make up like 75 percent of the workplace. So there's an even bigger kind of drive to have that consumer grade experience. But let's think about what we do at home. So if you don't know how to do something or you want some more information or you're stuck on something, what do you do? You look it up on Google, right? You go to a YouTube video. You perhaps go to a community forum and ask like minded peers, but you naturally do self serve. You might end up on a kind of virtual agent talking to somebody. Perhaps you've got a query with a bill or something like that. But you do go and find out for yourself. And I think. I mean, this last year, out of necessity, quite frankly, I have learned how to fix washing machines, dishwashers and, and cut hair. And this is all coming from um, those kind of like self-serve type resources that are available um, for us. But we often hear people say, well, that's the consumer world. It's a lot more uh, simple than the enterprise. But I don't think that's necessarily true. So think about Google, for instance, Google Maps, right? Somebody's asking you to travel somewhere. Um, that would be nice. But somebody's asking you to travel somewhere and you use Google Maps. You put in a, uh, a postcode um, into your mobile phone. And then what's happening then in the background is an awful lot of activity. That input has been interpreted. It's looking at your current geolocation. It's looking at where you want to go. It's looking at the traffic and it's actually making predictions about what that traffic will be like as that journey continues. It's looking at your preferences. It's looking at whether you want to avoid toll roads or go via petrol stations. And that's an awful lot of kind of different decisions if you like, that are being made in the background. But you as a consumer don't see any of that. It's completely hidden. That complexity is hidden from you. The experience you get is simply, yeah, this is my kind of time to my destination and then this is the first step of it. And so well, I think it doesn't have to be that hard in the enterprise. And when we talk about the enterprise, we do have to take that kind of complete um, approach to enterprise service management. So it isn't just IT, it's HR, it could be marketing, it could be perhaps you need a new brand template or you need permission to use a case study or something like that. It could be your legal department. And if you think about something like onboarding a new employee, that actually spans so many different departments within your business. It's definitely going to involve IT, definitely going to involve HR, workplace services, security, um, perhaps your ERP, um, uh, it, perhaps your kind of like uh, workforce planning piece as well, because as that new employee comes in, obviously you want to schedule them into work. So there's an awful lot of departments that are involved in, in that, which is why we think it makes sense to think about those journeys from that employee perspective and enable those journeys in whatever tool that makes sense for that employee as well.
because again that's very very important so now let's bring that kind of consumer side alive a little bit more and we like to talk about meeting um, employees in that tool of their choice and what we've seen last year is really the explosion in the use of uh, tools like Microsoft Teams. So let's face it, Microsoft Teams and, and similar have kept us connected over this last year, enabled us, like we're on Zoom today, enabled us to um, stay connected, do these virtual events. And within many enterprises, it's pretty much become that digital workplace. That's where you go to get your work done. And so we think it's really important that if you're spending time in some of these environments, why should you have to actually navigate off to a separate service management portal, for instance, to get help and get access to what you need? Wouldn't it be easier, just as that end employee, to get the service you need, not really caring what's delivering it in the background and stay in that tool of your choice. So we're going to show you how you can do that now. And what we've done here is we've got an integration with Microsoft Teams. And I'm perhaps in the office, haven't been in for a while. Uh, perhaps I've been chatting at the coffee uh, bar for a little bit. Um, but now I need a little bit of time to get my head down, get focused on something. So perhaps I'd want to book a meeting room. Now, Maybe this is a service that's provided through my enterprise service um, uh, management portal. But actually, I don't really need to care about that at the minute. I just want to fit my room, right? So I'm going to use my virtual agent here to help me. And I'm just going to type in book room at this point. Now, what's happening here is that um, ServiceNow is looking at me as a user and it's looking at my user profile and it's saying, okay, this, this is their base location. So I'm assuming, because they haven't specified where they want the room, they want it in that base location. And I'm assuming that they want it now because they haven't specified a time either. And then that kind of like, um, that integration with the meeting room management system will then happen to secure that meeting room. So nobody can then actually kick me out of it. So if you think about that, there's, Quite a bit of complexity really you know yes the look up of me as a user but then interfacing with that meeting room management system having a look at which meeting rooms are free allocating the meeting room telling me what my meeting room is but i haven't seen any of that that's been entirely shielded for me i've just had a really really great experience there so um now I need everyone to imagine that time when we actually go to airports um, as well. And it seems like quite a long time ago uh, since we were flying, flying around the world. Um, and when we're there, we've got a, last, a few last minute things we need to do. And one of those is just to make sure that I've finished off all of my kind of admin tasks before I get on that flight. And some of those come through on email. And actually email is still a really, really uh, useful tool for doing those quick approvals when you're on the go like that. So I'm having a look at, and I've got my laptop out because you know I've got to do these approvals, check on a bit of my last minute work. And when I look at the, my Outlook, what I can see, firstly, is that I've got an approval request that is coming from a member of my team, they want a new phone, and again, this in itself, not perhaps that exciting, we're used to approving things by email, but trying to make it as rich as possible so that I don't have to go anywhere else to, just, to get all the information I need to decide whether I want to approve that or not. I can see the cost, I can make a very kind of fact-based decision whether I want them to have it or not. So I'll say yes at this point. And then what you'll notice is, um, we're sort of dynamically repainting, if you like, the email at this point to show that, yeah, I've just approved that. And the good thing about this is that if I was kind of distracted halfway through, perhaps um, a phone call came in or something like that, I can see very, very quickly that I did actually approve that. I'm not having to go even look at my sent items. I'm not having to go to a uh, service portal and look at what action I, I took. And so, you know, again, meeting people in the tool of their choice, that makes sense at that point in time. If I'd been still in Microsoft Teams, I might have wanted to do that approval in Microsoft Teams as opposed to an email. If I was actually uh, a service desk manager and I was approving something for my team, perhaps I would be wanting to do that within service now because I was already in there. The point is making it very, very simple for people to get that work done without having to have multiple clicks and make, making sure they can do it in whatever tool they're working in at that point in time. So um, remember I'm at the airport, um, I'm sat in the cafe now, 
with my uh, with my cup of coffee, and then the worst thing happens. I knock that cup of coffee all over my laptop. So we've all had those moments where you think, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Even worse when you're about to jump on a jump on a plane um, and you've just broken your laptop. And what we're gonna show you now is that uh, another integration, this time with AWS Connect, but how we can integrate with the contact center and simply get help for that broken laptop. And I think we're seeing um, tools like AWS Connect being used a lot now, because obviously those cloud-based telephony systems um, can help deliver this kind of very modern approach. They're very good from an automation perspective. And of course, they add that resilience in as well. Um, and those people that have those cloud-based contact centers found it very, very easy to pivot to remote working over the last year. Now, I've got, I couldn't talk for long enough now. So I'm gonna kindly ask Mark, um, if he wouldn't mind actually phoning our contact center and, and telling them that I've broken my laptop. Um, so that we can get a new one ordered. So Mark, if you can phone the number I gave you earlier, that would be great. And put your phone, please, on the speakerphone. Uh, Neris, I'm just going to interject there. I can't see Mark on the um, on the list of hosts. Oh, uh, oh, so the other Mark is here. I know we're getting Mark L to do this. I've just seen something happen with the host. Um, we'll yeah. see what's going on behind so, the scenes. Uh, well, no problem. I'll do it myself, if that's okay, Neris, for you. Uh, yeah, you can do it, Phil. Oh, if that works, absolutely. Yeah, so that's we have Liv standing in for Mark. No problem. Imagine I'm Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm pressing the if, number. If, if, you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind saying that contact center sure. for me. Welcome to service now. In order to better serve you, please Spilt coffee on my laptop. Is that a replacement for your 13 inch MacBook? Yes. I have created a ticket to replace the 13 inch MacBook. It will be available when you arrive at your destination office. Do you need help with something else? No. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, Liv. Uh Good volunteering. Um, so what you, what you can see there is that when Liv called in, um, it was able to greet her by name. And that's because AWS Connect was passing through to ServiceNow her phone number. And we set Mark up actually uh, within our ServiceNow instance as well. So he would have been set up with a user profile as well. And as well as the, her phone number, she has a number of assets assigned to her, one of which is that 13 inch MacBook Pro. And um, so she wasn't having to kind of look for a serial number. She wasn't having to look for an asset tag. She didn't actually have to speak to anybody. Um, we used NLU there as well to understand the nature of what she was actually asking for, interpreting that and saying, okay, she's broken it. We need to get her a new laptop ordered. So again, a lot of complexity, but all she had to do was phone a number and she could have been walking to an airport gate or, you know, certainly on the move. Not much focus was needed really there in order to get that help that she um, that she needed. But that's not all we can do with chatbots. And yeah, a chatbot is only as good um, as how you set it up. And I often talk about the fact that when you're looking at how you set it up, you know, look at those um, those incidents, look at those um, interactions that you're having um, on a frequent basis and that you're able to resolve generally on a kind of a first time fix type basis. And that will help you really prioritise which conversations you want to create. So remember, I'm, I'm still at the airport now, so I'm just going to um, do a few other things on my virtual agent. So I got to the airport nice and early because I like to do some meetings from there. Um, because otherwise I would have been in transit whilst um, uh, doing those meetings. Now, um, I, my laptop is broken. I suppose I could use Outlook on my phone, but I just want a quick view of what my schedule is like for the rest of today. So I'm just going to type in at this point, kind of what's on or, yeah, what's on today or whatever. And then what I get is I'll get that summarised view of, um, of my schedule. Now, this could be coming from Microsoft Outlook. It could be coming from your native phone calendar. That's obviously depends on how you set it up. But as you can see, we're using this on a mobile phone um, and we're leveraging the geolocation of that mobile phone. 
And again, what's happening here is there's quite a lot of intelligence being applied. It's looking at where that uh, individual is. It's saying, OK, they're at the airport, which is highly likely means they're going to be travelling. And then looking at the services and the assets that I have, it's saying, look, this person isn't, doesn't have a call plan that's optimised for international travel. Now, that means if I go somewhere particularly like the US, the minute I turn on my phone's data and start downloading stuff, my company's going to end up paying a fortune in kind of uh, mobile charges. So it's proactively suggesting to me, do we want to change this? Do we want to change this to an international calling plan? So I'm just going to say yes, because it's super easy for me. I haven't had to kind of think about that. I'm saving the company money. Why wouldn't I say yes? And then from a business point of view, if you think about it, if you can proactively push out those services to those end users, that drives efficiencies for the business or drives adherence to a policy, perhaps. Right. It's much more likely that the employee is actually going to do that as well, which means, you know, you're going to be able to drive the outcome you want with whatever you're pushing out. So it's also asking me if there's anything else that I want some help with. And I'm thinking, yeah, actually, there is. Um, come to think of it, I'm not sure how much I've got uh, limit wise left on my credit card. I'm going to have to pay the hotel. So perhaps I need to actually increase this. So I'm not sure what to ask for, but I know it's related to my credit card. So I'm just going to type in credit card and then I get a series of options come back. So do you remember at the beginning I talked about those moments that matter? That credit card policy is a kind of I want to know uh, moment if you like. So perhaps if I wasn't sure how much I was allowed to spend on hotels or whether I was allowed to use my credit card for personal spend as well as business spend, I'd see that within there. Also, do I want a new or a replacement card? No. What I want to do is I want to increase my credit limit at this point. Now it's coming back and just asking me to confirm, OK, you have two types of credit card actually assigned to you. So which one is this? Is this the travel card or the purchase card? And at this point, we're going to say um, the travel card. And then lastly, I get asked whether it's a temporary or a permanent increase. So if this was a permanent one, perhaps it would have to go through another kind of level of approval. Perhaps it would need a kind of a manual uh, approval to be made by my, ma my manager, whereas a temporary one is going to be done automatically. And then when I click on that, what's actually happening is the auto approvals happening and then that notification and that interaction with that third party credit card company is happening so that my credit card can actually get increased. And again, you'll see here a common theme really is that I didn't have to care about any of that in the background. I didn't really have to think, I didn't have to say I want to increase my credit card limit on this credit card with this number. Um, I just had to have do some basic steps and I was kind of guided through that experience. So when we talk about great service management and um, Duncan I think talked about this as well, it's not about great service management itself it's about great service experience and that's for the teams that fulfill the services but also the employees that consume those services as well and we think there are three steps really in order to kind of get there so first one you know look at how you can consolidate and sort of modernize modernize your IT estate so adopt that those cloud-based platforms that are able to deliver the kind of consumer and the mobile um, experiences that you want and also the more modern platforms that will help you in integrating with those other systems that you're going to have within your enterprise. Second step is really about data. Using analytics and data to measure and get much more um, predictive information as well. So earlier when I talked about we need to be moving from reactive to proactive to predictive. So using machine learning to help drive some of that incident deflection away using things like chatbots to again deflect some of those incidents away from your team so that they can focus on those ones that are much more complex and focus on those more transformational kind of agendas and the value add work that we need to be doing and also using machine learning to help your agents deliver a quality service as well so they're not having to navigate and look at not knowledge base articles or you're not having to do a lot of training every time you bring in a new business service for instance you know building the intelligence where you can into platforms then means that you know your time to kind of value for those service desk agents is going to be a lot quicker and thirdly this is about optimizing continually having that culture of continuous improvement looking at it through the three lenses that we've been talking about so people process and technologies 
listening to people's feedback what's working well what's not working well like if you're bringing in new new hires all the time you know sit down with them and understand that process that they went through how did it feel what was it a good experience what could be made better use tools like process mining capabilities to then look at where the bottlenecks are in your process and then start to optimize and prioritize where those big bottlenecks are as well so i, I really think IT and being here at the IT Service Management Forum today, for me, you guys are actually the, the key to driving enterprise service management across the enterprise. Because once you get IT and then you add HR as well, you've actually sewn up probably around 60% of all of those kind of employee type service requests. So if you can start to, you know, build a blueprint for how you deliver that service, making sure that it's very much focused on that end employee. So build out those rich employee journeys. Um, you'll naturally then start to kind of spread um, across, across the enterprise. So I really think it's a great time and certainly we, we see it a lot now. There's a real appetite for how can I deliver not just IT services, but truly enterprise services. Because many times those, those end users don't actually know which department um, is actually surfacing um, or servicing, sorry, their requests. They just want to get work done. They just want to have a good, good experience. So I really think, as I said, you know, you're in a great place uh, to do it. And if you do want to talk um, to me any more about this, obviously I'm going to be in the breakout or one of the breakout rooms in a minute. Um, but I'm very happy for you to contact me um, by email or uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or um, on Twitter as well, as is Liv. So thank you ever so much. I hope this has been uh, useful. I hope it's shown you how some of the things that have been talked about this morning can actually be brought to life. Thank you.